Good. Well, I really am grateful to be here. I've solicited a lot of prayer from my friends, my uh, folks on Facebook, and so on. And I'm looking forward to interacting with this group, not just uh, this one time, but over several weeks. We have a class lined up, basically kind of a miniature apologetics class. But I want to start with this lecture called The Christian Mind, Apologetics, and Worldview. And maybe I can give you a little more background about myself. I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, my parents were decent people. They believed in God. I'd say they were God-fearing people. But I did not become a Christian until I was 19 in 1976. Before that, I had gotten interested in Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism and Taoism. I'd also started reading Western philosophy, was interested in some of the atheistic philosophers, actually, like Karl Marx and uh, Sigmund Freud. Friedrich Nietzsche had a big influence on me. But the Lord started to break into my life in various ways uh, through dreams, through encounters with people. Uh, part of the influence on me to become a Christian was through a Christian philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. And also I began to talk to Christian friends and read the Bible and so on. So sometime in June of 1976, I was in a group of young Christians and they asked if anyone would want to become a Christian to confess Christ as Lord. And I did that in uh, June of 1976. And I've had my share of struggles and difficulties. But I think of that song, you probably know it, I've decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. So now as a, an older man, maybe a seasoned saint, <laughs> I hope, with the right seasoning, not the bad seasoning, uh, I can say that I have more fire in my bones for the things of God than I ever have. So I want to make the most of the time that God has given me. Uh, Paul says, make the most of the time for the days are evil. He says that in Ephesians 5, 16. And also in Psalm 90, Moses said, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So a lot of my days are in the books. I don't know how many days I have left. I'm in good health. I'm desiring to serve God. But I am very, very passionate, and I guess you could say militant in a good way, to explain what the message of Christianity is. So the church can be built up in knowing what she believes and why and take it to the world. And I want to bring the message of Christianity, the gospel, the whole Bible, to as many non-Christians as I possibly can in whatever forms I have, whether that's teaching, writing, uh, witnessing to people through friendships, through encounters here and there. So what I'd like to do today is first talk about the need for a Christian mind, then the need to do apologetics, and I'll explain what I mean by apologetics. Then we'll talk a bit about apologetic method and the Christian worldview. And then in subsequent talks, we'll really get into the meat of how to defend the faith rationally, using evidence, using science, how to critique non-Christian worldviews, and so on. But this is really trying to lay the foundation, or you might say, give a framework for Christian witness. So let's talk about the idea of a Christian mind. Jesus said, when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Jesus is basically repeating what Deuteronomy 6 talks about. It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. And 
you shall love God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and then teach these truths to your children. But notice in Matthew, in the Greek, it comes out in the English translation as including mind. Now, the Shema in Deuteronomy 6 implicitly included the mind because it said to love God with all of your being. And of course, your ability to think and reason is part of who you are as a creature made in the image and likeness of God. But it's very clear here that Jesus says, you are to love God with your mind. Now, when we think of love, we often think of the emotion of affection, of wanting to be with someone or having warm feelings toward them. And that's true. But we also love with our thinking, with our intellect. So if a student loves the subject matter that she's studying, maybe biology or poetry, then she uses her mind in accordance with that love, with that concern to master the discipline, whether it's sciences or humanities or whatever it may be. Now, we as followers of the Lord Jesus certainly love him with our feelings. We thank God for coming to earth, for living a perfect life, for dying on the cross to atone for our sins, for rising from the dead ascending to the right hand of the Father, uh, where he now makes intercession for us. We, we love him, and we tell him that in our prayers and in our worship. But we need to include in the love, loving God with our mind. So that's what we want to consider. Basically, loving God with our mind means to think in a way that agrees with scripture, think in a way that pleases the Lord Jesus Christ, think in a way that does not grieve the Holy Spirit, but which is filled with the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said the Holy Spirit was the spirit of truth. And of course, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the famous verse in John 14, 6. Another very important verse for the Christian in loving God with our mind is from Romans 12, where Paul says, don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. That is, don't be worldly, but rather be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Now, sometimes Christians think that the life of the mind and faith are two very different things. That if you're going to use your mind, that's of the flesh. You have to have faith, which is from the Holy Spirit. But that's a false dichotomy. That's a false separation. Now, we can get in the flesh about our feelings and about thinking. But notice what Paul says. He says, we should be transformed through the power of Christ through the renewing of our mind. He doesn't say, put your mind aside or give up on critical thinking or don't engage, or don't engage apologetics. In you know, he says, be transformed through the renewing of your mind. Another concern here, and I'm trying to follow this outline, and elaborate as I go along. You, you might have your outline in front of you. We have to be cautious to not be deceived or led astray by false philosophy. Paul was dealing with this with the Colossians. There was an early heresy that was denying the goodness of the body. It was denying the truth about Jesus as Lord and Savior. And in Colossians 2, Paul says, not to be taken captive by any false and deceptive philosophy that depends on human tradition and the elemental principles of this world rather than on Christ. And then he goes on to talk about the fullness of reality that we have in Christ because he is 
Lord and Savior, and he has all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, in order to not be deceived by false philosophies, we have to identify them. And that involves the intellect. So in my 47 years of Christian ministry, I have done a lot of work on identifying false philosophies and false worldviews. Now, sometimes you get a sense of intuition about this. Uh, people can have the gift of discerning of spirits, and maybe without thinking it through a lot, they simply know that a teaching is bad, or maybe a leader in the church is not walking with God. But really, most of the kind of spiritual discernment that we do in detecting false philosophies is really intellectual. So if I hear a teaching or if I read a book that disagrees with scripture, I need to be able to engage in critical thinking. And there are a lot of books and teaching out there that are done by supposed Christians and they may use biblical language. They may talk about God, Christ, salvation. But they're really deceptive. So we need to use critical thinking skills to detect false philosophies. And of course, we have to know what the truth is to find the counterfeit. Right? We have to know the real thing, the genuine article, to spot a counterfeit. You probably heard this, but uh, people who are trained, at least in the United States, in finding counterfeit money, study what the real money looks like, the, uh, the larger bills, the, the 20s, the 50s, the 100s. So if they know what the real thing looks like, they can spot a counterfeit pretty quickly. Now, this is true in developing a Christian mind as well. We need to know what the Bible teaches. And if we know that, and we see something that is off base, out of line, we'll know that it's a counterfeit because a counterfeit is an illicit imitation of the real thing, right? It seems like the real thing, but it is not. So we need to know what the truth is. And Jesus said the truth would set us free. And we evaluate other claims against that truth. So we need a biblical view of life, death, morality, and eternity. And as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, we need to take every thought captive to obey Christ. He talks there about spiritual warfare. And it's interesting that the spiritual warfare involves refuting false philosophy. So I won't read that text or spend too much time on it. But I encourage you to look over that text. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, in terms of developing a Christian mind. So a Christian mind is a mind that is informed with biblical truth. It seeks more knowledge from God. It desires to be discerning, to separate the true from the false, the good from the evil. And in so doing, we need to be in a very prayerful attitude. That is, we need to be filled with the Spirit at all times and not grieve the Spirit because the Spirit is the Spirit of truth. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us through the renewing of our mind and teaches us to spot false philosophies and also gives us the courage to challenge false philosophies by showing that they're unbiblical and by using apologetics against false philosophies, whether that be atheism or Hinduism or animistic tribal religions or whatever that may be. So that's the first point, uh, the need for a Christian mind. Now, um, Emmanuel, do you want to have us do questions at the very end or would you like perhaps to have a question after each point, what is the best for you both? Thank you. I would like you to continue on for about an hour. Then we give them the opportunity for 30 minutes Q&A. 
but we've also asked them to ask questions if they have any at the chat button so we can compile the question. So you can go ahead, sir. Okay, good. Right. Now, again, how long basically did you want me to go for this lesson? I think an hour will do. Then we used uh, 20 to 30 minutes for Q&A. Okay, very good. Let's go to point two, the need to do apologetics. So what is apologetics? Uh, the term sometimes sounds like you're apologizing for being a Christian or you're sorry that you're a Christian. You know, to give an apology means to admit that you're wrong and you hope people will forgive you. But that's not the root of apologetics in the biblical sense. It really means to give a defense of your faith, give a reason for the hope that is within you to everyone who asks you. That's what 1 Peter 3.15 teaches. So the way I defend uh, or the way I define the defense of the faith is we teach that Christianity is objectively true, compellingly rational, and existentially pertinent to the whole of life. So let me spend a little bit of time on each one of those. We're trying to explain and defend Christianity as objectively true. Now, I say objectively true because a lot of people, when it comes to spirituality, are focused on their inner life primarily. And they don't consider objective reality, that is, the facts of the matter, the facts of reality. Now, we have to explain Christianity as being a set of what are called truth claims, truth claims about ultimate reality, who we are as humans, the way of salvation, ethics, the afterlife, and so on. These are truth claims. These are not reports about how we feel. They're not simply accounts of what Christians have done in history, but we're staking out territory about reality from the revelation of scripture. So objectively true. Now the Christian message should be subjectively meaningful and compelling, but not at the expense of objective truth. So we don't want to say, well, I like to believe this, or I hope maybe this is true. We want to affirm the Christian message as objectively true. And an example I give sometimes to distinguish the objective from the subjective is, if you were all in the same physical room, some of you would probably feel that it was a little hot. Maybe some of you would feel it's a little cold maybe some of you would feel it's about right but if you're all in the same room there would only be one temperature let's say 74 degrees and whether you feel hot or just right or cold is subjective but the temperature is objective so what we're doing in defending christianity is saying that while it is subjectively meaningful and compelling that's only because it is objectively true. So we claim that God exists, whether people believe it or not. Christ rose from the dead, no matter how many people doubt it. Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, even if many people think there are other ways to God. All right, so objectively true. And then secondly, compellingly rational. What I mean by that is that we can make a very strong case from science, from history, from human experience, that there is a God, that the Bible is reliable, that Jesus Christ alone is Lord and Savior. Now, we can simply affirm those things and confess those things as true, and we should, but we need to give reasons and arguments that will hold up that these things are true, okay? And then I'm just restating something I already said. It should be seen to be existent existentially pertinent to all of life. That is, if Christianity is true, and we claim it is, 
then it is relevant, it is pertinent to everything because it deals with our sense of identity. Who are we as humans? What is wrong with human beings? How do we account for crime and hate, and racism and all the rest of it? It deals with the way to live, ethics. It addresses our ultimate destiny, eternal life or the loss of eternal life. It deals with how to deal with our own guilt and struggles and sadness and so on. So my understanding of apologetics is that we are defending the Christian worldview as objectively true, compellingly rational, and existentially pertinent to the whole of life. And probably the, the classic text uh, is probably 1 Peter 3.15 which I had summarized earlier, but there are many other texts. Jude 3 is also a terrific text in terms of Jude saying that he needed to defend the faith given once for all to God's people. So I've got that verse right below it, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always, let me stop there, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So when we're doing apologetics, we shouldn't be prideful or arrogant. You want to have the best arguments for the things that matter most. But we should never be cocky or boastful or arrogant in our knowledge. Because whatever knowledge we have comes through the grace of God. And our salvation is through the grace of God at the cost of Christ's suffering and death. So we should remain humble. Christ is Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. To who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. So if you revere Christ as Lord, you will want to be gentle and respectful with unbelievers. Because if Christ is Lord, then you follow him. You want to be a humble, godly person. And being convinced that Christianity is true and rational and meaningful doesn't mean that you become retiring or bashful. In fact, it should be the opposite. You can be very confident in your beliefs and be gentle and respectful as well. But that's something you learn over time. And I continue to learn that. So, we need the direction and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to do this. Another verse that's very significant for apologetics is Philippians 1 7. This is this is Paul speaking. It is right for me to feel this way about you, since I have you in my heart, whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. So he's making a kind of incidental remark there. Whether I am in chains or Defending and confirming the gospel, which is something Paul did all the time in the marketplace and in the synagogue and so on. We see how he does this in the book of Acts. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about what's called apologetic method. You know, we need a method in various things of life. life. Physicians need a method for diagnosing and treating illnesses. Mechanics need a method for diagnosing and treating problems in cars and trucks and so on. And we need a basic method in doing apologetics as well. But the first thing I want to rule out as a approach to the Christian message is what's called fideism. Now, fideists will say that we can know Christianity is true just by our inner experience. We read the Bible and we discern that it's true and we sense God's leading in our lives and we feel the presence of God in worship and so on. So we don't need any apologetics. We don't need historical arguments, scientific arguments, and so on. We just have this inner testimony of the Holy Spirit, and that's all we need. We should never downplay the significance of 
the witness of the Holy Spirit in our hearts at the center of our being. The Holy Spirit is there, uh, however much or however little we know about apologetics. However, for example, when you read the book of Acts, you see that Peter and Paul are engaging in apologetics. Uh, they are defending Jesus as Messiah to the Jews. They are commending uh, the existence of God and the status of Jesus to the Gentiles. Think of that great apologetics chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 17, where Paul speaks to the philosophers of the day, the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers. So while the Spirit testifies to us about the reality of God, we want to continue to grow in our knowledge of God, not just in terms of our subjective experience, but in terms of presenting objective evidence. And we'll be doing that as we go along. So also against fideism, when you look at the history of the Christian church, you have great thinkers in the church who were apologists I think of St. Augustine, who wrote The Confessions, The City of God, many other works, St. Anselm, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, one of my favorite philosophers, Blaise Pascal, I've written much about him, C.S. Lewis, more recently, Francis Schaeffer, today living apologists like William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Lee Strobel, and so on. These are very rigorous thinkers. And in the case of Lee Strobel, who wrote many books, The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, The Case for a Creator, and so on, Lee Strobel tried to disprove Christianity. He was an agnostic, and his wife converted. And that bothered him, so he thought, I'll simply refute Christianity, and I'll show her she's wrong. And he realized that if he could refute the literal physical resurrection of Jesus as occurring in history, then Christianity would be false. It would be falsified. And all you have to do is read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8 to see that's true. So Lee Strobel began to research this and interview people and so on. And he came to the conclusion that Jesus did rise from the dead and Christianity was true. But this was not through any leap of faith he didn't have any particular religious experience, although God can work through that too. But he was convinced by the facts, the evidence, and the logic that Christianity was true. So what we need to do is develop a strong apologetic and then like to say, take it to the streets, which means apologetics without works is dead. And I'm elaborating or adjusting a bit what James 2 says. He says, faith without works is dead. So first of all, we need to develop a strong defense of the faith. And then as we develop it, we need to communicate this to the church. So people are built up and strengthened in the rationality of their faith. So they gain confidence because they're competent to defend it. And we need to be willing to present the Christian message to as many unbelievers as we can. All right, so let's, we're about halfway done, let's go to basic apologetic method. I hinted at that earlier. Now, everything I'm saying really is developed a lot more thoroughly uh, in my apologetics textbook which is called Christian Apologetics, A Comprehensive Case for Biblical Faith. And that's a very large book. The first edition was about 750 pages. The second edition is about 850 pages. So there's a lot there. So if you want to go deeper into any of these subjects, you can go to that book. And there's another book that I co-wrote with Andrew Shepherdson called The Knowledge of God in the World and in the Word. An Introduction to Classical Apologetics. That's a shorter book. It's a little more introductory. And that also will elaborate a lot on what I'm talking about with, with you folks. So let me talk about method. 
positive apologetics and negative apologetics. Now, what I'm doing now is giving you the outline of a strategy. I'll give you the actual arguments later through the class. So positive apologetics or constructive apologetics requires that we state the Christian worldview clearly. So a lot of people have misunderstandings about what Christianity is. And if they don't know what it is, then we can't expect them to become Christians. In fact, some people reject Christianity because of misunderstandings of what the Christian message is. A few years ago, I was teaching a high school group at a large church, and this was to help the high school students prepare for college. Because in the United States, a lot of Christians that go to college end up losing their faith. And part of the problem is they were never taught what Christianity really is or how to defend it. So we had this large class, pretty large class. And there were a few students in the back, three guys. And I could tell they weren't listening very well and they weren't responding very well. And afterwards they came up and they were trying to give me a hard time. And I said, well, could you explain what the gospel is to me? And they said, oh yeah, we've heard that in church all these years. The gospel is obey God, do enough things to please God. And then you hope that you will have done enough good works to go to heaven. And I said, well, you're clueless. That's not the gospel, that's the law. Uh, we cannot please God through our own works. Through the works of the law shall no one be justified, said the Apostle Paul. He was an authority on the matter. The gospel says that Christ came and died for our sins and rose from the dead. And we can accept him as Lord and Savior by faith, by lifting the empty hands of faith. And if we do that, we'll be justified, we'll be forgiven, we'll be adopted into God's family. And then we will want to do good works and God will empower us to do good works. I said something like that, but they had all this experience in the church and they thought they knew what the gospel was and they did not. So when we're doing apologetics, we want to state what the Bible teaches as clearly as we can in whatever setting we may be in. So as you talk to people, we speak to a group, you want to be able to listen to what they think Christianity is. You want to try to understand who they think Jesus is. And if they have a misunderstanding, of course, you want to, <clears throat> to gently correct them. All right, the second point is that you want to show that the Christian message is internally consistent in its assertion now by that i mean that what the bible teaches about god the human condition salvation ethics the afterlife is logically consistent so the bible doesn't contradict itself the christian worldview does not contain contradictions now this may come up for example with a muslim who will say, you Christians believe in the Trinity, but we Muslims believe that God is one, Allah is one. And your claim that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a contradiction because three does not equal one. That's very bad mathematics to say three equals one. Now, at that point, you have to try to explain that this is not a contradiction the history of the church has never claimed it's a contradiction. Rather, there is one God who exists in three co-equal, co-eternal persons. And you can try to make that case. Now, I've only given you just a little insight into that. But when we're doing apologetics, if we're going to use reason, evidence, and logic to critique other worldviews, we have to allow people who hold other worldviews, whether they're Muslims or atheists or whatever they are, to challenge us. So we can't say, we'll challenge you, but you're not allowed to challenge us. 
So we have to play fair. We don't have one set of rules for non-Christian worldviews and then another set of rules for our world. We want to be consistent with the logic, facts, and the evidence. We also want to show, thirdly, that the facts of history and science and also human experience back up the Christian message. So we want to say it is inherently internally consistent and it describes reality the way it is. So a crucial claim, of course, for the gospel is that Christ died, was buried, and rose again from the dead. If there were compelling historical evidence that Christ did not rise from the dead, as I mentioned earlier, then we'd have to say Christianity is not true. So one of the most significant arguments we give in apologetics is for the resurrection of Jesus. I have two chapters on that in Christian apologetics. And we also want to argue, as I mentioned, that the Christian message gives a livable meaning to life. That is, you don't have to shut your eyes and hold your ears to be a Christian. You don't have to, to look away and not consider what's going on in science or society or anything else. Another way of putting this is that Christianity is existentially viable. That is, it gives us a way to live and think and feel. Now, we're not saying that it's true because it works. We're saying it works because it's true. That is, it's objectively true. It corresponds to reality. And it corresponds to human reality, who we are as finite, material, spiritual beings who need direction and wisdom in life. Okay, so that's the basic positive apologetics. What about negative apologetics? If we're talking to someone who holds to a tribal religion or a Muslim or an atheist, we need to be fair to what that person believes. So it's good when you're doing apologetics to have some sense of what the other person thinks is true. So we want to present what we think is true and why, because people need to come to Christ to have salvation, be delivered from the power of sin and death and evil. But we also need to be loving to listen to what other people believe so we can show how what the truth is relates to what they believe. And sometimes there'll be overlap. So you're talking to a Muslim. Muslims believe in one God who created the universe. Christianity teaches that as well. There's one God who created the universe. But there'll be differences, of course, about the identity of Jesus, about his death, his being Lord and Savior, his being God incarnate, and so on. But we need to listen as to what, <clears throat> what a person's worldview is. Let me get a drink of water here. Now, the negative part of it is we need to try to show that the non-Christian worldview is either internally inconsistent or doesn't fit the facts or doesn't give a livable meaning to life. So let me go to Islam again for a minute. Islam teaches, the Quran teaches, that Jesus did not die on the cross. That supposedly was received by Muhammad. It's part of the Quran. Now, there's no good historical evidence to believe that outside the statement by Muhammad. And why should we believe him when we have the testimony of Scripture and all of the Christian church that Jesus died? And not just that he died, but he died to atone for our sin. So Islam at least has an apologetic problem on its hands when it says Jesus was not crucified. All right. Or uh, let's talk about for a minute a worldview that claims there's no such thing as objective evil in the world. Now, uh, earlier on in my Christian ministry, I wrote quite a bit about something 
that we in the West anyway called the New Age movement, this belief that we're all part of this great universal spiritual oneness. And if you realize your identity as divine, then you'd see that there is no evil. Everything is divine. Everything is one. So there's no room for the dichotomy or the duality of good and evil. Well, how do you square that when you hear about something that is deeply evil? Like rape or slavery. If there is no evil, then of course, logically, you can't identify rape or slavery as evil. So that shows this problem, this contradiction. Now, we need to do this, as I said earlier from 1 Peter 3.15, present what you believe with gentleness and respect, but also critique what other people believe with gentleness and respect. It's not a game. Now, my training is in philosophy. All my degrees are in philosophy from secular schools in the United States. And in philosophy, you are only as good as your arguments. And you want to win the argument. But as a Christian, we want good arguments for apologetic purposes, absolutely. However, we need to be humble in terms of listening to people's concerns and objections and questions. And we also need to be humble even when we're trying to refute someone. Because if they believe a falsehood, let's say they're a Muslim or they're an atheist, those beliefs keep them from salvation. So we want to take down those false beliefs that keep them from knowing Christ as Savior and Lord. So that's the basic structure of apologetics. We do positive apologetics. Basically, that's in two stages. We give arguments for the existence of God if people don't believe in a creator God. And we have arguments from science, from philosophy. We have cosmological arguments, design arguments, and so on. And then we also give arguments for the reliability of scripture, the deity of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the meaning of Jesus' death, and so on. And then negative apologetics, we want to show that the non-Christian worldview is either internally inconsistent doesn't fit the facts of history, science, and human experience, or is really not livable. It really doesn't fit the human condition. All right, so in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, let me talk about what is the Christian worldview. Now, you may or may not be familiar with this word worldview, it basically means a set of assumptions that we take to be true about the nature of reality, assumptions or presuppositions. So a worldview concerns the beliefs that we have that affect how we view the world. So for example, in the United States, there's been an increase in crime in the last several years, especially in big cities. And a lot of this comes from the fact that these cities are not policed properly and criminals are not caught and punished. And there's a worldview behind this, which says that humans are basically good. They're corrupted by social systems. And so if we just stop policing cities and if we let people go for crime, they'll generally behave themselves. Now, this is, some of you are laughing, this is laughable. It's based on a false worldview. It's based on the worldview that human beings are basically good, and it's only society that brings about crime or selfishness or anything undesirable. Now, when I see this happening in my own country, I think they're operating on a false worldview. They're operating on a view of humanity that puts way too much hope in human beings. You know, we are fallen and we are generally selfish. So when we talk about Christianity, there are a lot of ways we can discuss it. We can talk about the history of Christianity. We can talk about 
Christian experience through the ages. We can talk about the various ways that Christianity is expressed in the world today in Ghana and the United States and France. But one thing we do in apologetics is really focus on worldview, basic understanding of reality that we are given in the Bible. And there are various ways of structuring the idea of worldview. I give, I think, three of them in my book. I'm going to combine a few of those right now. So <clears throat> let's talk about the Christian worldview, it, which claims to be true. All the major religions claim to be objectively true, whether it's Buddhism or Islam or anything else. Sometimes people will say that religion is really not a matter of objective truth. It's just a matter of certain ideas or certain practices that have a positive benefit in your life. So it's more like um, a lifestyle or even a hobby. But really, the great religions of the world and the great world views do not present themselves as just therapeutic ways of getting through life. They present themselves as true, objectively true, and meaningful. And that's how we need to present the Christian message. So let's start with this. The Christian worldview, the source of authority for what we believe, is the 66 books of the Bible. And I won't read it, but 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, gives a very profound statement about the inspiration and usefulness of Scripture. Paul is there referring to the Hebrew Bible, which would have been the Bible he knew and Jesus knew. But by extension, we can also apply it to the New Testament, given the fact that Jesus authorized the apostles to record what he had done and to teach the church. So the ultimate source of authority is the Bible, which means that we take the Bible to be true on whatever it affirms. That requires, of course, that we engage in proper biblical interpretation that we not twist the scripture as peter warns about in second peter 3 16 he says uh, that some people twist the writings of paul as they do the other scriptures so we don't want to be twisters of scripture we want to be students of scripture and a very important doctrine in the reformation it came through people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and others, uh, was called sola scriptura, which means scripture alone has the highest authority. It doesn't mean that you cannot find truth outside of scripture. You can find truth in nature and history that's not recorded in scripture, but the Bible has a unique authority as being unimpeachable and of being the standard by which we measure things. Now, we have good reasons for believing in the Bible. We don't simply assert the Bible and say it's true and whatever contradicts it is false. There are reasons from history and evidence and logic to believe in the scripture, but I'm saying the ultimate authority is in the scripture. The second point is what's called epistemology, and that's simply has to do with the discipline of studying knowledge, how we come to know things as true, the various sources of knowledge, the various tests for knowledge. And the basic point I want to make here is that the Bible teaches that we were made, we were designed by God to know God, to know ourselves, and to know nature, and to develop nature, and have human relationships for the glory of God. Now, for example, atheism does not teach that. And that's a terrible apologetic problem for atheism. Because the atheism teaches that the universe was not created, it was not designed, and we are simply here through evolutionary forces. And that story of reality, that understanding of the human condition, really makes no sense in terms of knowledge, in terms of 
having justified true beliefs about the world because we weren't designed to know anything. The universe is just here for no reason. And over millions and billions of years, the universe evolved such that human beings show up. Well, the Christian account of knowledge uh, is really much more compelling. So the source of authority is scripture. Scripture teaches we were made to know God in the world, so our intellect is given a kind of sanction, a kind of authorization, because we're made in the image and likeness of God, Genesis 1, 26 through 28. And part of that image-ness, or being in the image, is the ability to reason, because God talked to Adam and Eve. Language has meaning. You can use your reason to understand language. We have creativity. We have relationality. So one way of dealing with the Christian worldview is the next point I have here, and that's to put it in a nutshell. And I very much recommend the work of a Christian worldview writer and apologist named Nancy Piercy, where she does this in her book, Total Truth. So we can talk about the Christian story of existence or the Christian worldview in terms of four categories. One is creation. God brought about the universe out of nothing by his will for his purposes. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1.1. And then he went on to create each thing according to its kind. And then he created human beings in image and likeness. So the universe has a personal origin in the uncreated infinite being of God. Atheists believe the universe has always existed without a beginning, or they exist, they believe that it came into existence just by chance, out of nothing, which makes no sense at all because things do not pop into existence out of nothing. Some other religions, like some schools of Hinduism and Buddhism, teach that there is no distinction between the creator and the creation. Everything is divine. There is no creation. So the Christian view is very different than other views here. Of course, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam believe in creation. But Muslims, interestingly, do not believe we're made in the image and likeness of God. They think that that would put us too near God, too much like God, which to their mind is a sin. But the second category of this nutshell is the fall. So we read in Genesis 3 that our first parents disobeyed God. They followed the temptation of the serpent. They did the one thing that God said not to do. And so they were banished from the garden. A curse was put on the earth with various effects. Work would now be more difficult. Childbearing would be more difficult. And of course, human death begins at this point. And we're later told uh, that the wages of sin is death, Paul teaches us. So death comes about through the fall, which the Bible presents as a historical event. And Jesus and Paul both affirm that there was a real historical first man and first woman. We see that in Matthew 19, 1 through 6, and also Romans 5, uh, 1 through 8. So there's this sad reality of the fall, but even though we were now separated from God in our relationship, we were estranged from God and from others, and really from even understanding ourselves, uh, that God doesn't give up on the human race. He sends prophets. He chooses Israel to be the place where the Messiah would emerge. He comes in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ to redeem us. He continues to reveal himself in the works of creation, 
the heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19, and so on. So God pursues the human race and provides redemption, which culminates, of course, in all the achievements of Jesus Christ. And I'll have one whole teaching on is Jesus the only way? We'll talk about his uniqueness, the finality of what he did, that he did what no other person has ever done to atone for our sins and rise from the dead. And he will come again. So the biblical message is the originally good creation, the fall into sin morally and spiritually, and then redemption or salvation through the power and goodness of God, not through our own good works, not by finding some divinity within ourselves, but by realizing that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There are none that are righteous, no, not one. So and we lift up the empty hands of faith to the Lord Jesus. And a part of redemption is point four here, and that is what could be called consummation or the summing up. And we're told that in the end, at the end of history, Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead, and he will create a new heavens and the new earth. The universe will be purged and perfected and judged. And we have such a beautiful picture of this in Revelation 21 and 22 about the new heavens and new earth, where there is no curse, no death, no tears. We are with God face to face with all the redeemed in this glorious setting, which is at once a city, a garden, a temple, and a bridal feast. I used to encourage my first wife, Rebecca, with this. She uh, passed away five years ago. She had a very rare form of dementia, which took her life on July 6, 2018. In fact, today, uh, would have been Rebecca and my 39th anniversary. But very sadly, she got something called primary progressive aphasia, uh, which is a terminal form of dementia. But she was a follower of Jesus, and she knew Christianity was true and rational and pertinent. And she struggled. It was a hard road for both of us, no question. But I would often read to her from Revelation 21 uh, and 22 about the glories of the final state. So she was suffering and struggling, brilliant woman, author of two books, editor, and she was losing her ability to speak and her ability to think. But we looked ahead to the consummation that Jesus promises us. So we've got that nutshell. Uh, we can talk more about the character of the ultimate reality, of course, who is God. He is an infinite and personal being, the I am, who I am of Exodus 3.14. And let me emphasize both the infinite and the personal. The infinite means unlimited and perfect. But God is also personal in that he's self-conscious. He's an agent. He speaks through nature. Psalm 19, Romans 1, uh, 18 through 21. He speaks in scripture, of course. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, and so on. He is triune, and this is what differentiates Christian monotheism from Judaism and Islam. Not three equals one, that would be a contradiction, but three persons in one Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the God of Christianity, of course, is the author of the whole story who becomes a participant through the incarnation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, and we have beheld his glory, as Paul says in John 1. We want to talk more about human beings. We say that we are made in the image and likeness of God, so we're more like God than anything else in the universe, but we are infinitely short of being gods. We are fallen creatures. We are physical, and our physical reality is good. Some religions say that to be saved, you have to throw off your body. You have to transcend the physical. No, Christianity says God created the physical universe. It was good. He created humans with bodies and souls. They were originally good. 
by the court. We have fallen in and need redemption. We should talk more about salvation in terms of uh, God so loved the world, he sent his only son that whoever believes on him might not perish but have everlasting life. That Christ died for us even though we were helpless and we were enemies of God. The glorious story of grace. And here too, the Christian worldview differs from Islam, especially because of this idea of the free grace of God that we receive by faith. In Islam, you have to try to work for your salvation. And while in Judaism, they believe in some sense in the Old Testament, they don't have as rich of a sense of grace as we have in Christianity. I was talking to a Jewish rabbi a couple of weeks ago, and I asked him about grace in the Hebrew Bible. And it, it was interesting. He had to kind of stop and, and think about it. It's certainly there. The grace is everywhere in the Bible. God called Abraham by his grace and so on. Salvation has never been through works. But it's interesting that this Jewish rabbi who did not accept Jesus as Messiah had a hard time really explaining grace in the Hebrew Bible, whereas we, who know Jesus as Lord, Savior, and Messiah, have the key that opens up the whole Bible that shows us Jesus and the grace of God and what was done for us. So instead of uh, continuing on with this outline, let me just talk about Christian existence and the adventure of apologetics, and then I'll throw it open to questions. So what I mean by Christian existence is, what does it mean to be a Christian, to be serious about Christ and the Bible, and to try to live in the truth? Now, this is something I have attempted to do now for many, many years, became a Christian about 47 years ago, and I have really desired to know God, to know the Bible, to defend the Bible, to proclaim and explain the gospel. I've written really about every major other worldview. I've written a huge apologetics book. God gave me a lot of time and desire and some ability to do this. And recently, I've been going through years and years, decades of my old papers and photos and letters and so on. And I realized that I have, from way back, wanted to make the gospel known to as many people as possible. Now, I don't really have what I would call the gift of evangelism in the sense of, I can tell you that I've led dozens or hundreds of people to Christ. Some people have that gift. And we should all do the work of an evangelist, no question. It's ultimately up to God and that person whether or not they come to Christ, right? But I've tried to be a consistent witness over all these years. I have helped lead a few people to Christ. And I know that I've helped pe people grow in apologetics. And then they've been able to lead people to Christ. Uh, just recently, just today, in fact, I found a tract that I wrote in 1982 that I handed out at a cult event with a friend of mine. So I've tried in various ways. We have all these wonderful benefits and freedoms as Christian, as a Christian. Let me list four and then talk about the adventure of apologetics really quickly. As a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we can be freed significantly from self-deception. Jesus said, if you're truly my disciples, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So we can be truthful about ourselves. We don't have to paper over our sin and our failures. We can be honest to God about our selfishness, our lusts, our laziness, whatever it is. You can be honest. Why? Because God knows everything anyway. You can't deceive God. And secondly, if we're in Christ, then his work on the cross atoned for all of our sin. We are forgiven. We are justified. We are adopted into God's family. And a verse I tell myself so often is Romans 8.1. It's one we should all memorize. You probably know it. 
there is now therefore no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus did all the work to set us right with God. We are justified through his work. He took on our unrighteousness on the cross. He atoned for that sin. And he gave us his perfect righteousness. Secondly, as followers of Jesus in Christian existence, we can be freed from the tyranny of the self. In America, especially, people are insane over themselves. The self is everything. You can identify as anything you want, and everybody has to agree with you. You can be a man and identify as a woman. A woman is identify as a man. And people get deeply offended if you ever challenge anything they hold to be significant. It's because they're putting, they're putting the self on the throne instead of God on the throne. But the self makes a very poor God because we are limited, finite, fallible, and sinful beings. So the answer to the tyranny of the self is what Jesus said in Luke 9. He said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. So you deny selfishness, you deny putting yourself first, you love God and your neighbor, and then you, you are third. There is that statement, I am third. Love God, love my neighbor, I am third. And that's the right way to live. That's the happier way to live. There's also freedom from self-dependence, wanting to find all the strength, all the wisdom in myself. And at least in America, people are always talking about their authentic selves or their true self. Well, your true self is two things, created in the image and likeness of God and hopelessly sinful. So that means you need Christ to save you, to redeem you, to justify you. And if you do, then you're freed from depending on yourself for everything, believing in yourself. You realize that you are nothing. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we have that long, beautiful discourse in the Gospel of John, chapters 13 through 15, about what it means to depend on Christ and learn to trust Christ through prayer, through humility, through worship. And we're ultimately freed from the final power of death itself. So we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the final enemy is death. Death came about because of sin. We see that in Genesis 3. Paul talks about that in Romans 5 and so on. But through the death and resurrection of Christ, death is defeated for those who trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. So we should let nothing move us. We should be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because we know because of the resurrection of Jesus that our work in the Lord is not in vain. That's a kind of a poor paraphrase of 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And before we take questions, I'm a little bit over, I apologize. I want to present apologetics not as some kind of a grim duty or something that's merely academic, although we do have a duty to do it, and it does have an academic side, but as an adventure. So think of what Paul said in Acts 20, 24. He says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. So Paul put the gospel, defending the gospel above everything else. And you see in the book of Acts and elsewhere that his life was an adventure. And he suffered greatly. He was thrown in prison. He was tortured. He almost drowned. He was almost lost at sea. But his life was an adventure in living for the crucified, resurrected, and ascended Jesus Christ. And that was of first importance to him. And if that's true of us, that gives meaning to everything that we do. And it's a meaning and a truth you cannot find anywhere else. 
And I testify to that myself. I certainly don't have the Apostle Paul's credential. But through all the seasons of my life, of uh, being a young man, following Christ, getting my education, doing campus ministry, getting older, being a seminary professor now for 30 years, and now uh, moving into my later years, uh, Christ is the meaning of life. And living for Jesus Christ and commending the Christian message and defending the Christian message is the best way to live. And in my worst moments, especially when I was suffering through the a disease and death of my first wife, Rebecca, I would often come back to John, John 6, where uh, many people left Jesus after a hard teaching. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, will you also leave me? And Peter said, to whom else can we go? There's no one else we can go to, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life. So let's take these words of eternal life to as many people as we can with as much wisdom, knowledge, integrity, and spirit-filled wisdom as we can. So let me open it up to comments and questions at this point. Appreciate everybody patiently listening. All right, thank you so much, Doc. And so I've seen your hand, but before then, there are some questions at the chat box. Let me read them. Someone wants you to share your thoughts on the historicity of Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 11, as against those who argue that it's a middle history or something that cannot be considered as literal account. And then also your comment on historicity of Adam and Eve as against some para theories available. Your comment on that. Right. Well, that's a big multifaceted issue. My understanding is that Genesis 1 through 11 is historical. It is not mythical. There were an original human couple that God literally took the dust of the earth and made the first man and then took the first woman from the first man, that Adam and Eve do not have animal ancestors, and that what we have in Genesis is historical. Now, with the Bible, you don't want to make it say more than it says, nor do you want to mute it. You don't want to stifle something it says because you take it to somehow be unhistorical or unscientific. So, for example, let's go back to Genesis 1. It says that God created in six days. The Hebrew word for that is yom. So some people believe that that is six literal 24-hour periods. I take it to mean uh, six ages or six periods of time where God intervened in nature to create each thing according to its kind. So I am not an evolutionist. I don't think Darwinism has anything going for it as a total explanation of life. I have two chapters on that in Christian apologetics. Uh, but I do think that the universe and the earth are quite old. But nevertheless, I don't believe that Darwinian evolution explains life on earth. It only explains a few minor things about how species develop but it doesn't explain the whole structure of the biosphere. And I another reason why I believe that is uh, the Bible itself. You know, Francis Schaeffer used to say, I'm not an evolutionist for two reasons. One, the Bible, and two, science. So the Bible itself, as I mentioned earlier, in Matthew 19, Jesus is asked a question about marriage, and he talks about, in the beginning, God made them male and female. So it seems to me Jesus believed in the special creation of of Adam and Eve. So if Jesus believed it, given his credentials, then I trust him. And then also Paul in Matthew, excuse me, rather in Romans 5, uh, teaches about the first Adam and then the last Adam. The last Adam is Jesus. So there are a lot of issues here about the proper interpretation of scripture. Uh, what does science and history teach us? As and again, you don't want to 
make the Bible say more than it says, but at the same time, you don't want to deny what it does truly affirm. So my best understanding of Genesis 1 through 11 is that in the creation, God did intervene, although it was not a six, probably not a six literal 24 hour period. But I do believe that God specially formed the first man and the first woman. And I think all the accounts of Genesis are historical accounts. We don't want to make any of it mythological or mythopoeic or something like that. And a book that has really helped me on that is Francis Schaeffer's book, Genesis in Space and Time. Thanks. And there is another writer, uh, an Old Testament scholar named Collins. I believe it's John Collins, who I think has done good work on the origins issue in terms of the Hebrew Bible and the original Hebrew. And I refer to his work in my book, Christian Apologetics. Big issue, rather short answer, but um, that's my understanding of it, given the evidence of science and scripture. Okay. Thank you. We will take him, Bosra, before we come to the chat button. Chat button. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Elder and, and Dr. Gretchen. Thank you so much. So my question is in relation to um, when you mentioned um, the sufficiency of, of the scripture, as in the scripture being truth and outside that certain truths that we can find. So in this world where, you know, there are certain truths out there which, which are legitimate, but how do you, um, I guess, navigate, you know, between these truths you know, in relation to what the scripture says, because there are some of them that might be true, but might not necessarily be helpful in consideration, you know, to our Christian faith and in our attempt to defend it. So how do we navigate through that mm -hmm. as to which one to accept and as to which one to throw away? Yeah, well, I think there are two issues there. One is how do we discern among the truth claims out in the world? And the scripture has to be the ultimate standard but it might be something that the scripture doesn't directly speak to. So if that's the case, then we simply make the best judgment we can with the facts, logic, and evidence before us. Now, if it's something overtly religious, like a Muslim says, God is not a trinity. Well, if you do good biblical work, you know God is a trinity. So that's refuted, right? But there may be other issues that are not quite as straightforward. So you don't want to hold any beliefs that contradict what scripture directly teaches or what can be inferred from scripture. But there's a pretty big realm of knowledge that the Bible doesn't directly speak to. So let's say some details of chemistry. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us about the workings of chemistry, but it does tell us that God is the creator of the whole universe, including chemistry. <laughs> and biology and physics and everything else. Now, a second issue I think you're bringing up here is what do we need to know? So there may be truths that we don't need to know because they're so unedifying. So for example, anything related to uh, pornography, we should be innocent of that. We should stay clear of that. Uh, there are weird writings about sexuality uh, that we should probably just be ignorant about. We don't need to know about them. Although in the United States, we have this thing called gender ideology. I don't know if it's really hit Ghana, but there are people saying some very bizarre, uh, unscientific and strange things about human sexuality. So I've been studying this and writing on this and speaking on this recently. But another area where we, we should remain somewhat ignorant is the occult. So in my studies over the years, I've studied world religions, cults, the new age movement, but I never wanted to know more than I thought was needed for my ministry. So in the occult, they practice magic, they cast spells, they do all these strange things. And I've never looked into that in detail because I know that that kind of activity is forbidden by God in Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. And we're told in Revelation 22, 15, that 
that sorcerers do not inherit the kingdom of God and so on. So there's some areas that we shouldn't know about because they're so unedifying and they're not needful for our ministry, right? And then of course, we need to consider what we need to know through our calling. So my calling is to be a Christian philosopher, apologist and teacher and writer. So I try to adjust my learning to what I think I need to know for my ministry and my life in general. So there are a lot of things I'm very ignorant about because I simply don't have time to study those things. But someone who's a, a chemist, you know, knows so much more about chemistry than I do. Or someone who's a historian of the ancient Roman world knows way more about that than I ever will. So I hope that helps. Was that what you were after or did I miss it? Okay, was that, can, yes. can we go on? Yes. Um, I, I think it's fair, you know, for the sake of others who want to ask questions, so I'll rest, but I think it's fair. All right. Thank you. We have six months journey to go, so we will continue to have more interaction with Doug. Don't worry. Dr. Joseph Opon, I've seen your hand. Kindly ask your question. Then yes, I'll go please. to the chat back soon. Okay. <laughs> All right. God bless you for giving the opportunity. Um, uh, Dr. Grotius, I've been blessed by your works, by your book, Christian Apologetics. I read them a lot. Um, but I, I wanted to clarify a question that I actually texted. It's about the parallelism, the issue of parallelism. Um, many secular scholars have kind of uh, identified close links or parallels to um, like, ancient, I mean, pre-ancient works like the Epic of Gilgamesh and some content of the Pentateuch. Uh, many have drawn a lot of parallels. Even the whole issue or the story of uh, Christ being our redeemer, the whole story has been modeled or compared to some of the, I mean, Greek and Roman ancient um, salvation stories, so-called. Um, I have had a number of opportunities to answer some questions, but I want to be really sure. What, what is the best argument to actually advance um, against uh, many who kind of uh, draw a lot of parallelism between the biblical mm -hmm. stories and that of um, fables, folklore, and all those tales? Thank you. Okay, good question. You would have to isolate the particular parallel. So let's start with the New Testament. Uh, the New Testament is better attested historically than any other pieces of literature about the life of Jesus and the early church. So any thematic parallels you find are actually incidental. Now, some people will say, no, the story of Jesus in the New Testament is cobbled together from these ancient mystery religions. There's no good case for that those mystery religions come after the time of Jesus and the supposed parallels are not really parallel. Now, when you come to issues in the Hebrew Bible, it might get a little more complicated, but the ultimate issue is whether the parallel would discredit what the Bible teaches as true. You can have parallels all over the place and it doesn't mean that what the Bible teaches is false. It could be that the Bible was dealing with themes that ancient cultures were dealing with. So there's some thematic connections and parallels, but that doesn't mean what's revealed in scripture is false. What you'd have to show is that somehow the parallel shows that there's a source more ancient than the Bible that is better qualified to speak on the matters to which the Bible speaks. That's a tall order. But parallels in and of themselves do not discredit anything in the Bible necessarily. I hope that helps, Joseph. A little bit. All right, thank you. There's <laughs> another question here. You want to find out the role of the supernatural manifestations in apologetics, even though he has granted your submission on logic, evidence, and historical yeah. data. What is yeah. the role of the supernatural? in apologetics to authenticate the christian faith well the holy spirit is vital at every level of apologetics 
But sometimes the Holy Spirit can give a special gift to aid in apologetics and evangelism. And I'll give you a specific example. About eight or nine years ago, I was with one of my young friends who is an excellent apologist, and he was reaching out to lots of non-Christians. So he and I would get together with his non-Christian friends. And we were meeting with a young man who was a fireman, very smart guy, was reading a lot. And we were dealing with some of the arguments for God from science, fine-tuning arguments, which I've written about at length in Christian apologetics. And all of a sudden, my friend uh, Taylor says, well, let's get to the real issue here. You're, you're really involved in pornography, aren't you? He said that to the non-Christian guy. <laughs> And the non-Christian guy said, yeah, I am. And Taylor said, well, that's what I think we need to deal with because the real issue right now is not the argument from design through fine tuning. The real issue is you're involved in pornography and that's casting darkness over your life and over your marriage. Now, I take that to be what Paul would call a word of knowledge. I didn't get it. My friend Taylor got it and I just backed off because the Holy Spirit was revealing truth about this unbeliever's life. Praise God. In fact, that man did eventually become a Christian. So yeah. we want to be open to the Hallelujah. Holy Spirit. You know, we want, I want to be as smart and knowledgeable and godly as I can when I talk to non-believers and when I write about apologetics. At the same time, I want to be open to the work of the Holy Spirit in a supernatural way, like with a word of knowledge or a prophecy, or I mean, just you know, you might pray for a non Christian and the prayer is answered, and the non Christian would think, What's going on here? Maybe it's something supernatural, maybe there is a God, maybe it's the God of the Bible. So, my own theology on this is um, charismatic that is, I think that that all the gifts of the Spirit that you see. Uh, manifesting in the book of Acts, for example, or that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, are still available to us as Christians. But we have to really put the Bible at the center to test what's going on, especially supposed prophecies and so on. So there's an American writer, you might have heard of him, named Wayne Grudem, who is a biblical scholar and a theologian. And he said, we need to be charismatics, but charismatics with seatbelts on. <laughs> you know, put the seatbelt on. The seatbelt is scripture. So you don't want to be so crazy. You get into an accident and fly out of the car saying you were led by the Holy Spirit. You need those seatbelts. And the seatbelt is the Bible and walking in the spirit and, and just some common sense. Wow. 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 That's wonderful. At this point, I think. It is time to defer other questions to our next meeting on the 18th. Doctor, you give us your final words. We have another great man of God in our midst, Apostle Dr. Alfred Kodia, the former General Secretary of the Church of Pentecost Worldwide. After your last words, he will pray with us so that as we are developing our minds, the Spirit of God will also lead us as apology. Mm. Say your last words. Amen. Yes. Well, I'm very honored and thankful to be a part of your ministry. And my word is simply that we are faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was an apologist. He was a great thinker, as was the Apostle Paul. And we need to submit to Scripture, be led by the Spirit. And we want to have a witness that is confident, competent, courageous, compassionate, and creative. You know, we want to use all of our abilities to make the gospel known to the world and to build up the church to be more confident. So that's what I hope that my writing and my teaching and my mentoring will do is encourage people along those lines. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to teach and I look forward to doing this uh, at least six more times. Yes, thank yeah. you. Our daddy will pray for us. Then after that, we'll give both of thanks to Doug. Apostle Doctor. Okay. This is why I'm thank taking you, you very much. Right. Let me see. 
Once again, a big thank you to you, our brother, uh, Professor um, uh, Douglas. I've personally read your book, some of your books, especially Truth Decay. And I yes. can only thank God for your life. God richly bless you. Thank you. I will pray. Father, we thank you so much for tonight and what you have done for us in this meeting. We want to thank you for the life of our brother Douglas and for all that you have used him to do to help your church, to be able to defend the faith in these difficult times. We are committing him absolutely onto your hands. Continue to endow him with whatever he needs. Continue to guide him through and through and continue to give him the needed wisdom, the grace and the ability to be able to even do far more than you have even given us tonight. We are praying, committing the other people on this platform onto your hands. You know their very needs. We're praying that Lord will tag their lives in any way possible. Let your face shine upon them and let your perfect will be done in their lives. We commit and commend all of them onto your hands. Trust them that Lord will see us through. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's Amen. Amen. A few announcements. Amen. On the, on the 18th, Senior Pius, I saw your question. You will answer <laughs> it and other questions. 18th of August, we will be looking at ATR, a critique of African traditional religion and spiritual warfare. Then on the 1st of September, we'll be looking at confronting new age philosophy and spirituality. On the 13th, we'll look at the authority of the Bible. That is where some of your questions on lost books of the Bible, extra canonical literature will be addressed. Sir uh, Nat, your question. We also look at the identity of Jesus Christ on the 29th of September. Then Christianity and other religions on the 13th of October the problem of evil and suffering on the 27th of October. So the first three months, this is going to be the outline. If you are here and you are still not on our WhatsApp platform, kindly get in touch with Clement. He will get you on. The material or the notes for this particular class will be shared with you. The video will also be posted, even though because we want to monitor the progress of participants, we will have to share it privately and see how we are implementing the content. At this point, I want to call my, I call her my trained sister and she's not happy. Now my wife, Gifty Emisa, to tell doctor and our pastor, Apostle, some, both of them. Uh, we want to thank God so much for today. Um, we thank Honorable Dr. Douglas Gruthius for blessing us with his presence tonight and for sharing um, his knowledge with us tonight. We want to thank, thank Dr. Um, Kodria as well for honoring us tonight um, with his presence also. I also want to thank my husband for putting this event together and I want to thank the leadership of ALI um, for all the hard work that you put um, into this event. And lastly, I want to thank each and every one of you for, you know, you could have been sleeping. I'm sure most of you have many, many things you could be doing, but you're here listening to the word of God. So God richly bless you and grant all your hard desires. And I pray that everything we've heard tonight, you know, it will not just be things that we've heard, but we'll actually use it in our everyday lives. So thank you once again and have a wonderful, um, whether it's afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are at this time. Thank you so much. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. God bless you all.